Thank you, Perrin. Uh, thank you, AIGA. It's uh, an honor to be here. Um, today, my talk is called The Materials of Design. It's a little bit different than what's in your program. Uh, Reimagining what design can really be made of. Sounds all right? Good? OK. Uh, so typically, people think about um, materials as form uh, and function, uh, and sometimes materiality material. Um, and the cliche is that design is the beautiful marriage of form and function. Certainly that's true for product designers, industrial designers. For probably more of you, design is the beautiful marriage of form, of, uh, form and content. And probably the marriage of form of content is what everything's always about. Uh, so I don't disagree with this, but I think that there's a much greater palette uh, of materials that we can use. And so my question today is what are the contemporary materials of design? Um, or better, what are contemporary ways of looking at the materials of design? Um, and I want to start with one of my favorites, and probably one of your favorites, too. As a company, we have an absolute commitment to the principle of action on climate change. We're very proud of our values. But as one of the major contributors to CO2 emissions, and as we begin to contend with the real-world effects of climate change, we have to prepare ourselves for the next step in addressing our corporate responsibilities in this area. While the steps on the surface seem to be in opposition to our self-interest, the reality is, however, that they are actually in opposition to our self-interest. So we recognise what we call the gap. The gap is the problem of simultaneously holding two contradictory positions. On one hand, to act on our responsibility to humanity, but on the other hand, to deliver on our commitment to superior value for our shareholders. We needed to take a leap of faith. An intuitive step outside of the limitations of science-based argument. I'm proud to announce the company's new policy of fuck you. you to watch all of this. Uh, so the design material here is parody, uh, which is a very powerful material, a wonderful material. Um, let me show you one more of these. You know, once in a while, something comes along that changes the way we live. A device so simple and intuitive, using it feels almost familiar. Introducing the 2015 Kia Capital. It's not a digital book or an e-book. It's a book book. The first thing to note is no cables, not even a power cable. The 2015 IKEA catalog comes fully charged and the battery life is eternal. The interface is 7.5 by 8 inches, but can expand to 15 by 8 inches. The navigation is based on tactile touch technology, which you can actually feel. Content comes pre-installed via 328 high-definition pages of inspiring and furnishing ideas. To start browsing, simply touch and grab. Right to left to move forwards. Left to right to move backwards. Notice something else? That's right, no lag. Each crystal clear page loads instantaneously, no matter how fast you scroll. If you want to get a quick overview, just hold it in the palm of your hand and using just your thumb, speed goes to content. If you find something you want to save for later, you can simply bookmark it. And even if you close the application, you can easily find the bookmark again. Amazing. So this is parody, except this is a real commercial. So IKEA did launch a new catalog last year, and this did run on television as a commercial for the catalog. So they're using parody as a, well, very much a design material, because they're not actually making fun of themselves. They're making fun of this uh, physical, digital uh, sort of you know, madness that we're in right now. Um, information as a material uh, is an idea uh, that I think is incredibly seductive. and. Uh, probably many of you are thinking about that uh, a lot, popularized uh, for me by uh, Mike Kunievsky in a beautiful talk um, called um, Information as a Material. Um, 
it may be, that's a little bit abstract. It may be easier for you to think about data as a material, which I think is very easy to, to imagine. And probably everyone's favorite piece of data visualization, at least mine anyway, is Fernando Vega's and Martin Wattenberg's uh, wind map. This should be. They have a beautiful lecture about this. So this is taking um, uh, uh, ground wind data uh, once an hour um, and plotting it. But because they plot sort of last hours and the hours before uh, uh, data points, they're actually able to um, uh, draw out tendrils that we read as animation. Of course, adding the dramatic music doesn't hurt either. Um, and uh, they're really incredible. And so you can go to this and you can look up the wind like right now, right here. And then they have some case studies. Um, well, actually, of Katrina um, and Hurricane Sandy and some very, very uh, amazing. And there's a lot of warnings on their website that you shouldn't use this um, as science. You shouldn't be like deciding to go sailing or how to fly a plane based on this data because it's an art project. Uh, but they get sort of constant calls uh, from the scientific community because this is just so unbelievably beautiful and compelling. And again, using data, using information as a design material. Uh, platform as a design material is probably my favorite right now, even though I already told you I had a favorite. This is my new favorite. Um, and so uh, to find a good example of this, um, I thought, uh, well, do you know about this Kickstarter campaign to get Kenny Loggins to play in this guy's living room? So he's like a, a Kenny Loggins super fan. And apparently it cost $30,000 for him and his band to come play anywhere. And so he raised it very quickly on Kickstarter. Uh, well, here, so look, this is simple. I mean, it's a great copywriting, too. Uh, and so uh, he did. And uh, so I found a clip from somebody's like phone in the living okay, room. Okay, so this one is for you, Jimmy Kimmel. So I like this idea that you're actually using the platform of Kickstarter to do something clearly that Kickstarter may not have been meant to do. It's actually the absolute beauty of Kickstarter. Maybe if you want to stick around after, we'll play the whole thing. Also, just two weeks ago, Edward Snowden went on uh, Twitter. Uh, so very, very quickly in a day, up to a million followers, he's following one person, which is the NSA, right? And so this is editorial, right? Like, he is using the platform as a design material, in my opinion, and making a narrative um, with that one data point, that statistic. Uh, persona comes into this. I've got a couple of things I really love. Um, Thirsty uh, NYC. And well, maybe maybe this one's funnier to you. Oops, sorry. Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so again, this is humor. It's using the idea of Instagram feeds as a way to create an, ator uh, an editorial to reinforce the persona of this Instagram account, uh, which is fascinating to me. So. I don't want to get too meta, but it is beyond like a humorous joke. It's, it's an actual way of creating like creative, I'm sorry, content now using platforms as paint. Uh, so uh, I created a program called uh, the MFA in Products of Design at SVA, uh, I guess four or five years ago. We just welcomed our fourth year of student. Students, And so I'm really interested in design education as a way to make a difference and in some sense as a, as a design material itself and, and you know, hopefully as a future design material. Uh, I'm going to show you a few pieces of student work. Um, this one under the category of performance as a design material. And so uh, this work came out of a course called Design Performance, arguing that design can no longer sit on a pedestal and be sort of looked at and or purchased. Uh, but actually needs to be performed, that it is experiential. I mean, many people in the room are already like, on this story uh, of, of experience design. And so the students did a project around gender, which is very difficult for them because they came from many parts of the world uh, and there are a lot of uh, you know, ethical norms that are very, very different. Uh, so it was called Engender. 
Um, and it took place during New York uh, Design Week, which is now NYC by Design. And so the students made all these props so that you could try on different parts and pieces. Here they are in the New York City subway station just for fun and walking around Soho at night into different uh, party openings. So uh, some of this is a little bit, uh, this is my favorite piece actually. And so just like this line element trying on different party parts. A lot of it was sort of man, woman, woman, man. Uh, yes. And, uh, and also yes. Um, this was interesting. Uh, a couple of the students were walking around with babies and in gender neutral uh, swaddling clothes. And so you had to smell the baby's uh, heads like you would uh, with a real baby and guess their gender. And they used uh, commercial deodorants uh, for, for gendering, uh, which were completely arbitrary. And like nobody got it right. Uh, so that was fascinating. The next time you buy secret, um, you can buy Old Spice, I guess. Uh, people loved it. There were these uh, tattooing syringes, and you know, it was a little bit, it was trying to be a little bit transgressive, and people uh, marking their bodies and coming up with different gender icons. Uh, we had some software that allowed people to like, get a little bit taller, a little bit wider, change their face. Uh, the subtle ones were actually the most effective ones. Um, this is Sovic. And, uh, and this was probably one of my favorite. This is Yang, one of our students who can do, who's an amazing caricature uh, artist. And so what, what you would do, he would walk up to you and say, can I draw your, your portrait? And you'd say yes. And so he would draw your portrait and then um, uh, hand it to you and sort of you know, surprise you because he would draw you as the other gender. Uh, again, sort of stereotypically male and female. And so people like love this and of course like, oh, Instagram right away. Uh, so if you knew the gimmick, it was not quite as amazing, but it was, uh, so it was like zero tech, which we really, really loved. And so we had these different installations, these different teams of, of students going around and doing these kinds of design performances. Here's our drawer. Uh, context as a design material. Uh, this is a recent image, or at least recently found by me, uh, physicalizing the planets in terms of, you know, sort of as marbles on a table. Uh, it's a really radically recontextualizing, you know, what we are. And so I'm really, really interested in space and scale. And this to me is sort of astoundingly, you know, humbling and ennobling all at the same time. Uh, and so just one image like this, and I'm going to show you a uh, moving image at the end that I would uh, like you to sort of pair in your mind with this. Uh, it's fascinating. Participation as a design material may be the most powerful one. Uh, my personal feeling, my belief, is that if you add participation to anything, you make it better. If you add any more people to anything that you're doing, it gets more better. Um, I'm sure there are counterexamples, but let me show you a couple. So this is Livia Ito. I also teach in a program, also at SVA, called the MFA Designer as Author and Entrepreneur Program, uh, the MFAD. I love teaching that program. I love that program. And so I did a project with them that I've been doing for the last few years, um, which is to redesign the next thing you throw out. So it's not up to the student what their project is, and they try not to sort of, you know, connive their way into what they're going to throw. They could be throwing out a desktop icon, you know, a Microsoft Word document or a paper towel. So Livia threw out a birth control uh, package. And so one of the things that she revealed to us in the research, at least revealed to you know, the men in the room, is that it really matters when you take your birth control. You don't just build up the level of hormones and it's okay to like, miss a day or even to miss 12 hours. The actual hourly taking of it um, is critical to its efficacy, something I, I did not know. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of work in here, but let me show you her final um, video. I keep the one. loud in here, but because we have, oh, well, yes, do that, Livia. I will call her and tell her.
Uh, so you may have actually some conflicted feelings about this, and that's good because I'd like to show you lots of work today, which is my favorite, uh, to show you work that's sort of right on the line between good and evil. You don't know if this is sort of a good thing or maybe like a bad thing, and uh, sort of where are the roles and responsibilities around agency and sharing. Uh, but in any sense, when you add participation, in this case of a partner, behavior changes. And uh, this was a quick uh, seven-week uh, uh, product here with lots of stuff before it. <laughs> Permission as a design material, very, very powerful. The students um, did a pro uh, course called Design and Politics. It was a workshop. Uh, and beautifully, coincidentally, it happened while there was an election last November. And of course, this was a halfway election, so a lot of people didn't you know, quite care about this election. And so the students did a bunch of research around why people didn't vote. And they ultimately created a non-voting booth uh, and put it up in Washington Square Park. And people would line up um, and essentially have a kind of permission to talk about why they didn't vote that day. Uh, research revealed that there were some very sort of obvious and maybe not so obvious to you reasons why people didn't vote. Uh, but in this case, there was a physicalized place. And it was nice that it was in Washington Square Park as well where they could uh, essentially pick a sticker. Oh, well, they're allowed to be loud. OK. Um, and, uh, and also like a, you know, sort of a write-in one on the right. And then put these stickers on the booth uh, in a way to actually vote of, to, to uh, visualize what, the, what most people's reasons were for not voting. Um, and, then, um, and then there were some follow-up uh, audio interviews as well. And so just really making it very real and in some sense legitimate. And so there was a kind of weird celebration of not voting. And so again, you can have a conflicted feeling about whether that's good or bad. But the fact of the matter is people weren't walking around either ashamed or embarrassed or sort of hiding like I didn't vote and I don't plan to vote today. There was a place where they could actually uh, talk about it that they didn't think that their vote mattered or that it counted or that it would make any difference at all, um, which is what a lot of uh, the students heard. Uh, so that was nice. Uh, subversion as a design material, we love. Uh, so this is also from the MFAD program. This is uh, Katie Trout. And so she threw out a uh, washing machine detergent tablet. So do you know these things? They're like super designed. They're super beautiful. They're so beautiful that kids think that they're candy um, and eat them and like, you know, get poisoned um, and die often. Uh, so this is, this is like a perfect example of designers making things worse every time they make things better. Um, because I know it's really hard to like pour liquid into the dishwasher, and then you have to close the cap, and you have to put it back in the cupboard, or like you have to pour powder, and you might pour too much or too little. You know, like these are not real problems. This should not be taking designers' time, uh, but they do. And so these are very sweet looking ones, right? Very delicious looking. Uh, and so Katie did a bunch of uh, ideation drawings. We did a whole, whole bunch of things. And there was a lot of uh, moral ambiguity in the class, as I say, because there are a lot of students from different parts of the world. So I'd asked the students, and this was the first time that I had done this, to create apps for the next week and to do one evil app that would destroy the world and to do one good app that would save the world as a way to just create a little bit more relief between sort of what was good and bad uh, and what should be worth your time as a design practitioner. And so you can guess the result. The evil apps were like totally awesome, right? Like way more interesting, way more fun. The students loved doing them. And so, and they were easy. Uh, the good apps were actually hard. And so that was fascinating and something that we spent a lot of time talking about. So for Katie's uh, evil app, she created Venom, which was a way to actually poison your friends, right? With household items taking off from the from the dishwasher detergent. So you could pick different recipes, um, and, uh, and then there's a list of people over at the end where you can knock them off and you can click them off. And, uh, and so everyone like, went nuts and just like, completely loved these things. And so the course was actually called Design Decisions, so people had to decide what they were going to do next. Uh, so she did a business model canvas, several of them, and came up with this idea of, of creating a service like Birchbox, which sends you like, a monthly you know, box of stuff. Uh, and then, oops, um, and then just like totally branded the thing, right? Retox. A pretty sick monthly gift uh, box subscription uh, to essentially send to people you, I guess, don't like and poison them slowly, beautifully, through design. Right? 
And then she made this. Introducing a new way for your kids to think about beauty products. Venom is a new application for Apple and Android devices that shows your kids how they can cause harm with the beauty products they've grown up seeing and using. Kids are given a list of beauty categories to choose from. Once they choose the category, they are taken to a page full of suggestions and beauty cocktails. Kids are able to save their favorite combinations by double tapping on a suggestion bar. They can then go back and view all of their favorite combinations for later use. Each user is also able to set up their own test subjects list. They can add subjects with the plus sign or check their subjects off once they finish testing on them. Venom is a way to highlight to our youth that we are all slowly poisoning ourselves with the beauty products we use on a daily and ongoing basis. From lipstick, to hairspray, to nail polish, we are all making the choice every day to poison ourselves little by little, so we may as well go ahead and have a little fun with it. Venom, pick your poison. Yeah, wow, right? <laughs> Best audience ever. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, wow, you know, when you use lotion and you touch a receipt, the BPA is going to get released off of the receipt, the, you know, cash register receipt and into your skin and, you know, we're all aware of body burden. And so this is fascinating. And again, like good and evil, she's not giving up a lot of the evil in this final video, this kind of PSA for product service app, like we're not sure what it is. And the target audience is interesting. This came up uh, with, the, with the Command X. Like I think this is for my daughter, my 14-year-old daughter. Uh, Bronwyn, who is really interested in cosmetics and, you know, will learn more about them. It's really uh, quite fascinating. But it shows you the power of design when you make something look this real and then you can actually have a conversation about it. And so this is speculative design or critical design. It's probably not to, uh, meant to really be in the world. But sometimes you wonder, like, maybe we actually should put this into the world uh, and not just use it as a, as a device for debate or provocation for debate. Um, this is very interesting and potentially troubling. This is May Sun, uh, who did a thesis on women in technology. This was a year-long project. I'm going to show you just one little element from it. Um, and this was uh, inspired by a quote from one of her subject matter experts. Said, she said, I do not feel secure being the only female engineer on the team. Even though I have comparable technological skills, the boss still prefers to ask the male engineers most questions. And so this is very common. Probably some of you are experiencing this. May was really interested in creating robots. She was really interested in physical computing and Arduino and hacking and robots. And so she created a device called Puppy. And I'll just set this up. Uh, so before you use Puppy, you load it up with your perfume that you typically wear or your pheromones if you can figure that out. Uh, but let's go with perfume for a second. <laughs> So again, like, does it totally buy into stereotypes or is it really smart? When you walk in there and it smells like her and it's just like, oh yes, this is her room. This is, that's, that's who's running this meeting. Fascinating, subversive and uh, quite interesting. Uh, I probably don't want to forget about design as a design material. So. This is Eden Liu, uh, back in our program, um, who uh, threw out a prep sandwich container after she ate the sandwich. Did a lot of mind mapping and tons of work and storyboarding and came up with this idea that people are too busy and certainly students are to take a lunch break. And so sewed up this very crude, very silly hood thing. Uh, you may be familiar with this because it completely broke the internet uh, for a couple days. And, uh, and then sewed a better one, learned how to sew 
uh, during this. And then we went straight to campaigns. Uh, and it took two days for the container store uh, lawyer to call me uh, and ask us to take this down, because it was like everywhere. And they kept getting calls and visits of where can I buy this thing. And we not only, she not only had to take off the container store, but she actually had to remove contain yourself, because contain yourself is actually a trademark term uh, owned by the container store. And he was a really nice guy, actually. He sent me the trademark you know, paperwork so that I could show it to the students and make it a teachable moment. Uh, anyway, so uh, we have our students like go all the way with this stuff. You have to just see it as if it were a real thing in the world to be able to evaluate it. Uh, so she, um, she did some research, of course, uh, hopefully, uh, for all of us, um, and realized that this idea of, of meditation and mindfulness is obviously a very healthful thing. Uh, many people know this, but uh, she didn't, actually. And, and it got pretty deep into it uh, and was brilliantly able to integrate the logo into this diagram about the psychological benefits of the product. And then just move very quickly to Nutshell Labs, because if you want to like experiment and do sort of wild things, you create a lab. That's like this magic word that allows you to experiment and like, you know, fail, like total permission to fail. So she just made up Nutshell Labs. Uh, back to the website, uh, added a bunch of logos on the bottom. Ironically, she could have had real logos once this thing hit the internet. Uh, so just made it up, just put those on there. Um, and did a really beautiful job. There's a shop at the website, of course. So she had to sew a dark one. That's the nutshell blackout. Uh, and she actually did uh, sew the Bose head shell, which was like this audio thing. But then she completely made up the hood shell, which is coming soon, uh, and the shell seat, which would have taken a while to make. And then, of course, she throws in the made in the USA at the end. Just like makes this shit up, right? So that you can see it and say, hey, like, should we do this? Uh, and of course, there's an app, because everything is a fucking app, right? So there's a, a Nutshell Labs app. It's time to take a break, and so you can listen, and you cr can create, because we want user-generated content, always. And so there's music and lead meditation, but maybe you're good at spoken meditation, and you want to record one and upload it to the Nutshell platform so that other people can enjoy your spoken meditations, right? You're laughing, it's good. Uh, and then she even does this. She mocks up an Instagram screenshot of people who are nutshelling, right? Like invents the hashtag, right? So that people all over the world who are using this thing and having lunch in it and meditating in it will share themselves. And I guess there's views from inside and views from outside. So she goes like all the way. Uh, and this is in eight weeks. And yes, yeah, she's very talented, but I think that you know, when we're working certainly with students, when we're working frankly with clients, you have to go all the way to be able to make any kind of decision about whether this should happen or what you're making should happen. And so this was really rough for Eden. She actually she sent me a stat slide, but I don't have it. I'm sorry, I should have had it. But the thing went out, it was on BuzzFeed. It just like went completely nuts on planet Earth. Uh, you know, it was, it was like, does she need to quit school and go make these things? And so there were a lot of, you know, emergency meetings about this and how to handle the media and how to send thank you notes and just, you know, radio interviews in the Ukraine. It was just sort of unbelievable. And, uh, and I said, well, like, you know, is it any good? And she goes, well, it's kind of hot in there. <laughs> you know? Like she hadn't done any user testing, right? Which seems like a, a design crime. But that's not what this project was about. This wasn't about like invent like a great product and do a good job inventing it. This was in some sense like invent the nutshelling movement and then decide whether you want to back into it or not. It was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> Delight as a design material. I mean, this is this is probably you know the the nicest one. Uh, I've just got a couple examples for you. So this is Berk Ilhan's uh, master's thesis. And he did a, a thesis around um, terminal illness, particularly cancer and cancer sufferers. It was, frankly, an, an incredible thesis. It's very well documented on our website if you go to productsofdesign.sva.edu. Uh, the project overall was called Uplift. He started with speculative objects, critical design. Um, many people are afraid of needles, but they probably wouldn't be afraid of this, which I think is kind of sweet. Um, and also, if someone's going to stick a needle in your arm, maybe you get to stick a needle in theirs. You know? So it's like, designers talk about empathy. It's just like, yeah, here's empathy. It's just like, give me your arm now. 
this was probably a key moment in the thesis research. Um, one of his uh, interviewees had said, in the first days after my diagnosis, it was weird to look at myself in the mirror and acknowledge that I have cancer in my body. And so this got Berk really interested in self-image and identity and uh, treatment. And so he created the smile mirror uh, because his research revealed that it actually really matters that you smile. I know that it's uh, like an old salesperson's trick where if you're doing sales, you should have a mirror and you should smile because like uh, phone sales because people can actually hear a smile over the phone. Uh, but there is all sorts of new fMRI data uh, like physicalizing happiness makes you happier. Uh, and this is, it's a, it seems commonsensical, it's also kind of radical as a kind of treatment. And he really wanted to productize this in a way that would encourage people who were in treatment to smile more. Um, and so he had this idea for the smile mirror, uh, where if you smiled, it would turn on. And you know, these kinds of prototypes aren't quite enough. Uh, we want things that actually work and proof of concept. And so he fired up the Arduino and worked with another student. the plexi, and it's essentially measuring the, the brightness, the whiteness. So when you show enough white in your teeth, um, it will uh, trigger the, uh, the flip in the LCD. So then he did this. And so the idea here is that you would install these around your home in your, you know, consumer electronics or your kitchen products, and that in order to turn them on, you would have to smile. It's a very, very sweet idea. He did a lot of work around laughter therapy and tested these, in some sense, like a Google Cardboard with uh, YouTube videos of people laughing. I should have had one. No, I don't have it. Um, if you check out the website, you'll see it. But uh, when you watch people laughing, you laugh. Uh, and so he put together a playlist. And so there are, there are YouTube videos of people laughing on YouTube, because like, there's any, everything on YouTube. And so if you're ever feeling like a little bit blue, just you know, type in like, you know, people laughing into YouTube and just watch a couple of them, and your mood will change very quickly. Uh, and when you put it like this, so he had conceived of a helmet that I'm sorry that I'm not showing you, uh, where you'd be immersed in these people laughing. Uh, and did some testing uh, with some physical therapists with people who had injuries that were um, really uh, just depressing them. And uh, the feedback was incredible uh, and enormous. And you know, when you consider that you can deliver these things on any smartphone with a Google Cardboard kind of uh, headset, the access to this was really um, something amazing. The final project that he did that I want to show you is, um, well, I'm going to play the video.
to me, this is such a beautiful of the power of design. I mean, it's a sticker, you know? It's made of nothing. But he did all of the research, all of the interviews, all of the technology, and then ended up with a sticker that is like completely amazing. And I think you have to do all the work. I'm not sure you can just get to the sticker, maybe sometimes. But I just love that that's how this thing ended at the sort of least tech possible. Uh, and he had learned so much and met so many people and got so many people excited about this project. Uh, the last design material that I wanted to talk to you about uh, is Unity as a design material. So it is really, really hard to find any image that is going to make any kind of impact uh, on us in terms of environmentalism. It's, uh, it's noisy, we're cynical, uh, it's just really, really tough. Uh, and I was uh, giving a talk, I was with Tim Brown at the IXDA conference uh, a few months ago in San Francisco, and I really wanted to talk about this and I didn't have like the background image for it. And it was, I was running out of time. There's like 10 days till the conference, nine days till the conference, eight days till the conference. And I just sort of kind of believed that something would drop down from the sky uh, that, would, uh, that would like do anything to like me and anything to you. Uh, and so this dropped uh, down from the sky. This is how I found it. This is on uh, Flipboard. Uh, so the title here is Global is the New Local, Pollution Changes Clouds, Climate Downstream. Right? And so this is how uh, NASA writes the title. This is how Good Magazine writes the title. Watch Chinese air pollution work its way around the world in this scary NASA animation. So that's a design material too, right? How you write the headlines. So I couldn't help but click on this one, of course. Let this play for a minute. You can see the days on the lower left. So that's September 13th, 14th, 15th. I don't know what to call this design material. I'm calling it unity. I don't know that word doesn't have a lot of power anymore. Maybe it has some new power. Anyway, this is the material I want you to use too. Extraordinary. So designers have never been more powerful, ever. I don't think that there's any arguing that. Information science, we have the internet, anyone can answer any question that you have, like infinite, overnight, for free, because they want to. Uh, material science, information science, uh, it's just, uh, you know, we can kind of make anything that we decide to make. Um, what we choose to make is, it's uh, obviously the question for all of us. Um, this is amazing and ironic and tragic because it's happening right at the moment when we sort of need, need designers most. Okay. And so uh, I would like to, to conclude by asking you to make a very, very conscious decision about you, how you spend your time. Uh, you have X number of decades of design work. Uh, some of you have five or six or even seven decades. Uh, some of you have three decades, or four, or two, or really one decade. Um, it's a lot of time. You're gonna be working like a long time as a designer, uh, but it's not a lot of time, you know? And I think that uh, we have so much privilege. I've said before that designers are so privileged, we're so lucky, uh, that uh, our problems literally are solving other people's problems. Like, that's how lucky we are. And so you need to like, make a decision about how you're going to spend that privilege, that luck, uh, and be like, super daring in your work and to consider all of the manifestations um, of what you can do because you need to consider all the implications of what you do. It's hard to know those. It's hard to know the consequences of our design. That's why what I wanted to show you today is just so many design ideas played out all the way to get to the absolute end then you can have the meeting and say, should we do that? Should we invest in that? Should we partner with that? Should we fund that? Uh, should we buy that? Should we throw that away? Um, I think it's a really, I think it's, in some sense, we have to do that now because the, the tools that we have are so powerful that we actually can visualize the last 
point, right? The end point. Some people said that designers design endpoints now, which I think is sort of hysterical and maybe actually true. Um, because we, we have the tools to do that, because designers uh, are superpowers to make things visual that are not visual, to make things visible that are invisible, and to create prototypes of things that are not real, but look real to regular people, that's how far you have to go, in my opinion, to get to, in some sense, the first meeting, right? Not as the final thing before you ship. Uh, and that's uh, really the idea that I'd like to get across today. Um, and I've never done a summary slide. I don't like summary slides. And I was just like, ugh, I'll try one. Although now I've blown it because I've talked about it. Uh, so here's a bunch of design materials that have nothing to do with form and function and materiality uh, that maybe, you know, yeah, and this slide will be available. And I make this slide available. Uh, that maybe is, a, again, a new kind of paint for you to, to play with, to paint with uh, as a creative person while you are obsessing about how you're going to spend your, your decades of work ahead. So I know you have many affinity choices, uh, and we appreciate you choosing this affinity choice. Thank you. Sure.